when I'm talking about this, my you know keep in mind that the ethical dimension of this is extremely important mm. because we seem to be like creating technologies to extend our life, but we haven't created life that we want to extend. 60 to 80 percent of the people don't want to live longer. So what I'm saying. We need to fix this world, like inequality, you know, different social constructs, our relationship with modern nature, before we can actually enjoy our life in a different uh, form or with completely different, longer health span and lifespan. Doctor's Kitchen. Recipes, health, lifestyle. Well, let's talk about longevity, okay? Yeah. And um, so when I, if you look at my book, I'm talking about, you know, three different time horizons. Mm -hmm. So one is now. It's actually right in the end of the book, in the bonus chapter. Again, it's twice as long as any other chapter in the book. There are so many things that you can do right now. And it's today is like high tech part, high tech part of today is really about power of wearables, which are becoming our uh, personalized healthcare devices. Mm -hmm. It's not activity tracker anymore. It's something mm -hmm. which will really help you to monitor and manage your health and manage a lot of risks uh, on a day to day on like minute to minute basis, actually, uh, uh, right now and very soon. Um, and the other high tech part of it is like early diagnostic, just using like there's all these three Tesla MRIs, the beauty of medical screening to detect killer monster diseases, which are responsible for 90% of our deaths after the age of 50, which are uh, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and neurogenerative diseases, at least in the developed world. Um, yeah, just you know, doing the medical screening every year. As I always say, the, the most important day of your life every year is the day of your medical screening you know my wife has a kind of different answer to that question and she disagreed with me but uh, i i actually think like when i have 30 seconds on longevity i push people to do their medical screening mm -hmm. um and it should be as comprehensive as possible that you can really afford and it should be at least once a year and i i'm doing this every year in san diego california in human longevity yeah. center um but uh, you don't need to go to San Diego. Yeah, it, proper checkup is not a rocket science. Any meaningful, uh, experienced doctor will be able to advise you on uh, and arrange it for you. Um, so that's actually about now. And and so that's the high tech part of it and low tech part. We just discussed it. It's your lifestyle changes. Okay. Um, so then, in a book, the majority of the book is actually dedicated to so-called the near horizon of longevity innovations. Yeah. And yeah. these are the technologies and, and scientific discoveries which will be available to all of us in the next 5, 10, 15 years. And um, there are many of things, and this is where we actually invest with my longevity vision fund. We're investing in, we're looking at 200 companies a year to invest in eight or 10 of them. Um, and when people ask me like, Sergey, what are the most exciting technologies which should be available to us in a decade or two, which will help us to break this sound barrier of 122 years, the maximum lifespan on earth and add decades of healthy and happy years to our life. I'm always talking about three things. So one is gene editing and gene therapy. Because we already know all 3,000 genes in our DNA. Uh, and we can either amend the DNA, which is basically gene editing, or we can influence the way these genes express themselves inside our body. So this is called epigenetic. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, epigenetic reprogramming is one of the things that Professor Sinclair from Harvard Medical School and many, many other uh, talented science are working on. Mm. So if we can influence this expression uh, of these genes, then we can actually reverse aging inside our bodies on a genetic level. And uh, if we can reverse our own age by three years, become three years younger in the course of eight weeks, just by changing sleep, exercise, and diet, imagine what we can do on genetic level. We can actually find you know, all the rare genetic diseases. And while they called rare, there are 400 million people on Earth who are suffering from rare diseases altogether. Um, so that's one. Um, 
And we, we actually on gene, gene editing, we made a huge progress on that. 25 years ago, it took 13 years and I think it was $3 billion mm. for the United States to sequence human genome. Right now, you can do it in just in, in a few hours and it yeah. costs a few hundred bucks, right? Yeah. This is how far we went on that uh, thing. So the second piece is what I call longevity in a pill. I'm talking about a completely different class of drugs, category of drugs, which would not look at the symptoms of particular disease, but would help us to, to manage um, aging process and influence aging processes inside our bodies, slow them down, you know, kind of freeze your aging process or even reverse them. And it can easily be a new drug developed with the help of artificial intelligence. AI changed a lot in healthcare. AI is, is a theme in probably three fourths of our investments and in longevity vision fund. And, um, or it can easily be a repurposed drug. The drug that we already know, like metformin, uh, the old diabetes drug that we know for probably at least 60 years with pretty safe uh, risk profile. It's still a prescription drugs, uh, drug in majority of countries. So you'll need to see a doctor and consult with him or with her. But uh, it seems to me uh, that metformin can be a good candidate for longevity drug. Uh, mm -hmm. We still need to run a human trial. And there's a very good friend um, whom I'm seeing in Boston this Sunday. Uh, Professor Nir Barzilai, who is together oh, yeah, with the American right, yeah. Federation of, mm. of uh, Aging Research, mm. I'm a board uh, member of, of our American Federation of Aging Research, are trying to start the massive 3,000 uh, people study uh, where in the course of a few years, metformin is going to be tested in the context of longevity drug, not only as a diabetes drug. Um, so the side effect of metformin, and this is the hypothesis we need to test in scientific terms, is certain life extension for mm. uh, all of us, uh, or at least for the group which are predisposed for or have higher risk of diabetes. Um, so that's that's the second piece of the near horizon of longevity innovation called longevity in appeal. Um, and the third one is replaceable organs or organ regeneration. This is part of the bigger area called regenerative medicine, like stem cells are there as well. But well, think about the old car. We can, as a metaphor, we can extend the um, lifespan, if you want, of the old car just by replacing, you know, different parts. You can never replace like an engine. And um, and I think the technology and the approach of the future for us is uh, at least, you know, as far as we remain in the current biological form, it's going to be to replace organs or systems inside our bodies. In fact, actually, two most different, most difficult things to replace um, are our brain and our heart, which is not a surprise. Mm -hmm. um, but then we, it's just an example. So like to replace organs, you can use different avenues. Like you can actually 3D print organs. Yep. We still are not there in terms of massive production, in terms of uh, compatibility of 3D printed organs with our bodies. But uh, a lot of 3D printed organs um, printed from biomaterials are actually used for scientific experiments. And this is this is great relief and huge efficiency uh, driver of scientific experiments because before that you would actually need to use either animal models or um, human organs for these experiments. Um, so you can do like 3D printed organs, you can use uh, other Mm, animals to regrow human organs like pigs we're very genetically close with uh, uh, pigs um, or uh, you can actually regrow organs inside our body in our lymph nodes and three years ago we invested in a company called like Genesis they based in Pittsburgh uh, amazing company what they do they take donor liver and by the way, like liver transplantation is, at least in the US, is extremely expensive procedure. Yeah. It's six to eight hundred thousand dollars. You would need to wait for a month for your donor liver to arrive and, and be available. And in terms of like organ transplantation, it's a huge shortage of organs. As far as I recall, uh, last year we had like 117,000 people who were on the waiting list for donors. Some people die 
while they're waiting for their organs. So what you can do, you can take donor liver, split it into 50 to 70 pieces. Well, here's your opportunity to help, you know, not uh, to give a hand of help, not to one person, but like 50 to 70 people from one donor liver. And um, they put it there uh, inside your lymph node. It's actually right here. Uh, with a very simple surgery. And then in the course of three to six months, your body will uh, regrow the new liver. And then it's just a lot of interesting things uh, happening. In fact, your new liver, like a liver B, uh, stops to grow exactly at the moment when it takes all the you know, necessary function, which is suitable and, uh, and uh, needed for your uh, body. Uh, that's actually pretty cool. So they've done a lot of studies in, in animal models, like with dogs, with the primates, obviously mice, um, pigs, etc. And it was very successful. And um, this January, actually, 2022, they started, they got FDA approval and they started human trials. And they oh, had wow. huge demand to be participate in that with people um, uh, from people who uh, have like a terminal liver disease and they're about mm. to die from there and functioning uh, liver. So I'm like really excited about our ability to um, replace organs or regrow organs. And therefore extending the healthy part of our life called um, health span. So that's really briefly around three most exciting avenues, three most exciting fields of science and technology, which would help us to live far beyond 80 or 100 years, which seem to be like a current limit for um, human lifespan. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think just to anchor the listener as to why we're talking specifically about these uh, different areas of longevity research and funding, um, if you think back to the different hallmarks of aging, there's inflammation, there's uh, epigenetic changes, there's there's breaks in the DNA. There's a whole bunch of different areas. And then also at a political and science level, aging isn't as recognized as it should be as a disease in itself, which is the root cause as to why we see cardiovascular disease, uh, uh, strokes, dementia, or the, the suite of, of issues that we, we lump as lifestyle related. Um, so I think, you know, going after those root mechanisms behind why those uh, actually lead to the diseases of aging is basically where it sounds like your investments are concentrated. And a lot of people don't yeah. don't hear this and they don't understand why this is so important, because we're not just talking about this narcissistic endeavor to uh, make us all immortal. It's actually about looking at how we can improve the health span as well as the lifespan yeah. as well. Yeah, so I, uh, you're exactly right. And our chances or risk to uh, suffer from, you know, all these terminal diseases or killer diseases that I call them, I increase exponentially after mm -hmm. aging processes start to um, uh, start to manifest inside our bodies. Uh, it usually starts from the age of 40 to 45 with certain deviations. Uh, but like after the age of 50, it, it, like every few years will increase the chances of getting and dying from, you know, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, uh, neurodegenerative disease exponentially. And, and, and you're right, um, there is no economic and regulatory model today to invest in longevity and aging. Like do a simple experiment. Um, go to, well, if we are in the UK, go to Boots, right? or if you're in the US, go to Walgreens or CVS and uh, ask for drug against aging. They will think you're crazy or they would just send you to cosmetics or to supplement section, right? And I, I don't think it's actually logical. If we can influence something, you know, uh, on the roots level, on the, un you know, on the underlying level, we should use this opportunity. Mm, absolutely. And you, you've used this term in the book uh, called longevity escape velocity or velocity. radical longevity yeah. extension. Um, I, I would love for you to give us an insight into 
what you think the world might look like in a little bit longer. And I know you're, you're known for saying if you just last an extra 15 or 20 years time, you're going to have access to all these technologies that are rapidly growing yeah. that could even, you know, bring us even further. Um, so what, what does that like waking up uh, in, in 50 years time look like uh, and, and the things that you're most excited about as well? Yeah, so uh, this is what I call the far horizon of longevity innovation. And yeah. these are the things which will be available to us in the next 25 to 50 years. I'm actually waiting for this uh, with combination of excitement and fear. Okay, mm. so some of these technologies are really, uh, I couldn't really accept the fact that we're going to be using that. But knowing what I know about longevity field as an insider, let me share with you what are my takeaways about this whole thing and by the way when i'm talking about this my you know keep in mind that the ethical dimension of this is extremely important mm. because we seem to be like creating technologies to extend our life but we haven't created life that we want to extend 60 to 80 percent of the people don't want to live longer mm. i mean it's probably just a lot of uh misconceptions about longevity but let's not discuss that so what i'm saying we need to fix this world like inequality you know different social constructs our relationship with mother nature before we can actually enjoy our life in a different uh, form or with completely different longer health span and lifespan okay so the, and by the way i've just last year i've done it was in london i've done it TEDx talk called morality of immortality. Mm. So if if you guys have 15 minutes, you can take a look uh, at this as well. So moral implication of that is important. So how the world will look like in 25, 50 years from now? Well, the, remember the near horizon of longevity innovation. And I told you like, uh, within the near horizon, we'll be able to break this sound barrier of 122 years. We'll have all the technology and all of the science uh, to live beyond 120 years, probably 150, like whatever the number is. Um, so what's next? Um, I do believe that it's almost impossible for us to live beyond 150 years in the current biological form. So in the future, man and machine will become one, okay? And it's gonna be, it, it's actually the theme for my next book, for my second book. Um, and, um, we are we're going to be living in a, in a world where humans going to be we're going to be different versions of humans like it's going to be a world of human argumentation it's going to be a world of human body and mind 2.0 mm -hmm. and um what are the technologies that we're going to enjoy we all going to be full of sensors um sensors will will be embedded and and uh they're actually going to be interconnected so we'll have similar to internet of things that you know today we're going to have internet of bodies from the word uh, body um, in the future. And it's going to be artificial intelligence, which will help us on the individual and the societal level to manage and monitor our health. It's going to be a world of nanobots, which is going to be flowing inside our different liquids and inside our body and kind of fixing different problems, doing diagnostic um, as well. Um, it's going to be a world of human avatars. Um, and uh, funny enough, we were about to invest in, in avatars and we were hesitating between robotic form and, um, and um, uh, virtual avatars. And uh -huh. it seemed to me actually, and it was shocking for me to realize that reconstructing ourselves in the virtual environment was much more efficient and cheaper. So, and I hated this idea. So we didn't invest to robotic avatars because we were not sure they, they had a winning um, dimension of this development because I hated the idea of living in, in a virtual uh, environment. But it was it, it, very interesting. So for the for my book, when when we were covering the human avatar um, uh, part of the text, I actually interviewed Professor. Uh, I think his name is Sasumi Tachi. Uh, mm. He is from Japan, and he was the one who invented human avatar concept back in 1980. He still call it te tele-existence. Amazing guy. Uh, and I also spoke to Peter Jackson, the man behind Avatar, Lord of the Rings, um, yeah. and, uh, uh, and um, uh, Hobbit's uh, movies about the future of uh, the world and the influence of Avatars uh, 
on that. Um, our brain gonna be uh, interconnected with computer power and with artificial intelligence. Funny enough, we already have this integration with uh, computer power with, and with artificial intelligence, and it's our smartphones. We outsource a lot to our smartphones. Like this simple example is uh, we outsource uh, uh, the the task of memorizing phone numbers oh yeah to our yeah. smartphones right yeah. i just know like phone number of my wife and my assistant that's yeah. that's basically it. yeah not even my parents um and uh this is well done we're just using very inter inefficient interface today like yeah. i'm using my eyes you know ears yeah uh to uh, my fingers to type something this will change so man and machine will become one uh, brain computer interface similar to what is done today by Elon Musk in Neuralink. Uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, and, and, and the trade off here it's uh, between kind of invasive form of um, this integration uh, versus non invasive uh, form of integration between the brain and uh, computing power. Uh, that's basically it. Um, so here's the world. And then you already touched on the point of immortality. I'm not a big fan of immortality at all. I actually think if you take out the death from the human life cycle, we're not going to be humans. But again, knowing what I know from the field, it doesn't look like we would need to decide one day whether we're becoming immortal or not. The way it's going to look like technically, uh, it's like every five to 10 years, you will need to decide are you going to live another five to 10 years? Are you going to embrace, enjoy, and use the, the latest outcome of you know, available science and available technology to extend your lifespan? Um, so that's, that's the whole idea. So it's going to be like a series of your uh, life extension decision uh, every three, five, um, 10 years. And it's actually, it raises a lot of moral issues as well, because yeah. in the current world, your decision not to extend your life is considered a suicide or consider it like a plain gut. So just a lot of things that we need to change, debate and discuss on a societal level from the ethical perspective to switch into this paradigm of living. But I'm pretty sure it's going to be available for everyone because mm. the way technology developed itself, we're talking about the huge democratization coming to the healthcare. And um, like almost every technology that we invest in in Longevity Vision Fund, remember my mission and our mission is to bring affordable and accessible version of medicine and technology uh, to the world, uh, it decrease the cost uh, of the against the current treatment or current intervention, current way to deal with particular disease by factor of five, 10, sometimes even 20 times. So the future medicine is going to be data-driven, technology-based, and it's going to be much, much cheaper to the extent that I do believe, and I, this is my dream, that one day the highest and the best version of healthcare services is going to be offered uh, to everyone for free. But I, I'm always being idealistic, so um, yeah. <laughs> balance it with voices of some skeptical guys as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm a, an eternal optimist, but I do hear a lot of pessimism around this, particularly when it comes to equality. But I think you, you made a really nice parallel in the book uh, with the uh, inventors of the uh, of Human Flight, um, Wright Brothers and a few others as oh, well, yeah. about how, you know, initially when you're even broaching the idea of Human Flight, it's A, ridiculous, and B, you know, once you do achieve it, it's inaccessible to the majority. But, you know, uh, decades later, it's accessible to most people on average incomes. It's allowed an incredible amount of uh, globalization. We can experience cultures from around the world and we see it as a net positive thing, uh, aside from the environmental pollution aspects, which yeah. we will be figuring out yeah. as well. So I think that's a nice lens to view uh, longevity in. I agree. I agree. All right, we're living in a world when Ryanair or EasyJet will, uh, you know, bring you from A to B with the same speed like private jet or you know business class on British Airways, and I really enjoy it. What What's your main sort of argument against people who say that we shouldn't be entertaining this idea, particularly uh, with regard to how we are going to be uploading our 
memories and our personality onto the cloud, which almost seems quite inevitable. I mean, we already do yeah. a lot of sharing uh, across social media, albeit in a relatively analog way. It's just like an extra step towards that. Like all my stories, yeah. all my information, everything is on social media, it's on my website, yeah. everything's already been uploaded. So it doesn't seem that far a step for uh, integration. Yeah. Yeah. So what do I think? Well, number one, we doubled our average lifespan in developed world in the last hundred years. So it's, yeah, it's went up from 35 to 40 years. Think about this. The average person hundred years ago were living in this world yeah, for like 35 years. Okay. And um, so we almost double that. It's, it's well, above 70 years and above 80 years in some of the countries like Switzerland, Japan, uh, Singapore as well. So no one had a debate whether we need to increase the average lifespan from 40 to 80. Okay, so this this will continue uh, and and this will grow. And right now when we have the access to exponential uh, technology and, and, and different scientific breakthroughs, again, uh, supported and enabled by exponential uh computing power that we have um I, I don't think it's it's really um it's it's really a matter of choice it's almost inevitable from from this perspective so that's one second thing we tend to think about ourselves as a peak as a like maximum of what human of evolution of human beings and homo sapiens will look like but we just part uh, in 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 this evolution process, right? And and future hu humans, um, well, they they should not necessarily be uh, similar to us. So we'll just it, we'll have a another um, dimension, right, or the horizon within the human evolution process as well. And there are a number of uh, you know things there like people always ask me like will mother planet sustain this whole growing population mm. and my answer is always like well think about food like in the us only 45 percent of food uh goes to waste every evening from restaurants households uh, supermarkets this is ridiculous we have yeah. enough food on this planet to feed more and more people not to talk about advancements in in agriculture energy like re renewable energy resources will will be super helpful in this regard and and in terms of population of on uh, earth um uh if you look at the latest studies uh, the way it looks like it's going to peak somewhere around 2050 from current 8 to 10 or 11 billion people and then it's, it's going to go down to eight again by the end of the century. China alone will, will lost in the current um, uh, in the current rates will lose uh, 600 million people from 1.4 to 800 people. And and then all uh, all the parts of the world, with exception of Africa, which will retain a positive reproduction rate, um, the rest um, societies and 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 population on country by country basis will become uh, older, uh, but more efficient, more productive and younger in biological age term. So for me, it's not an option to bring um, longevity uh, technology to the world. It's a response to the silver tsunami and massive demographic changes that we're already seeing mm. and we'll see in the future. And like, forget about 2050. Uh, I was just speaking this summer, oh, sorry, summer 2021, I was speaking at uh, Singapore and Singapore will have 25% of its population at the age of 65 and above by the end of this decade. Wow. So the time is now we need to respond to that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Don't usually ask these kind of questions to sure. the, the guests, but I want to, I mean, like you're a successful investor, you have this, this amazing vision about bringing longevity and improved health span as well as lifespan to a billion people worldwide what does a great day look like for sergey that's what i want to know Oof, um there's so many answers to that uh, one i'm father of four so they're like the, the best day for me is just it's saturday on and sunday when i can spend time with uh four of my kids okay nice. and we live uh by the river and a huge house um, 
we rent this. I'm not owning this. Uh, because all my resources, I'm not Elon Musk, but like he's a great uh, model for me. All my resources are committed to longevity and investment, not necessarily to owning you know, any piece of real estate. Um, so we live by the river and I usually do like three or four hours of walking while listening to podcasts and uh, you know, different scientific lecture, lectures as well. So if you do, if you, if you look at like Monday to Friday, mm. uh, so what do I do? Uh, when I start, uh, I have like 30 minutes. It's not a magic morning. I don't know if your audience is um, is familiar with the magic uh, morning book yeah, and routine. Yeah. It's not like a magic morning, but this is my version of the magic moment. So I need to do something for my body. I need to do something for my brain. Mm. And I need to do something for my soul. So body, um, it's usually... I. I Six out of seven mornings uh, during the week, with exception of Saturday morning, I start with physical exercises. So, you know, twice a week I do yoga and stretching. Twice a week I do functional um, training. And twice a week I do Pilates. Um, mm. So that's that's kind of my body thing. Uh, then for, um, for my brain, uh, I, I just usually do like five or 10 minutes of reading mm -hmm. and, uh, and usually it's pretty, you know, science heavy literature, uh, or something dedicated to, uh, human health and biology. Um, like the latest string was younger you by Dr. Carr, uh, uh, I think it's Carr Fitzgerald, um, who's done this amazing study when they reversed the aging in a group of people by three years. So that all of them became three years younger uh, mm -hmm. in the course just uh, of just eight weeks, changing what is the miracle uh, tools, sleep habits, physical exercise habits and the diet. I love it. I love it yeah. when we all be, you know, can become younger, almost like free of charge uh, yeah. in the course of um, eight weeks. So younger you, um, yeah, I'm, I'm reading the new Kit Ferrazzi uh book about uh, he called it present of work not the future of work uh he's a very good friend of mine kit Ferraz is the author of never eat alone like the best and, and the mm. most famous networking book um um in the world i think uh so so that's that's my kind of brain stuff when i'm just trying to read something in the morning which i can use for my kind of thinking processes and reflection time uh, during the day and for the soul it's usually like it, it, I'm, I'm like less disciplined of doing uh in doing something for my soul so like every and i doing this probably every second morning not every morning uh because i'm kind of lazy and i uh, have attention deficit disorder i have so many things on my plate intentionally uh it's usually like meditation or gratefulness or reading something uh of the spiritual nature um that's it yeah. yeah so like once a week i just do like meditation on uh how do you call it in english it's like uh nail beds something like that like you know piece of wood with a lot of nails on it and you just stand <laughs> yeah. on that yeah yeah it's pretty painful this is like probably the most painful experience i've ever had but after first five minutes you actually can you know stay on that for as long as you want. I usually do like 40 to 50 minutes and that's wow. uh, very interesting. So that's, that's my morning routine. Mm. So then I do, so I'm just trying to integrate in the picture of my day for our audience, I was just trying to integrate the different longevity habits that I'm, I'm using. So that's kind of one. Then <clears throat> the second thing, if, if you look at my kind of food consumption pattern, uh, I'm big fan of fasting. Uh, mm -hmm. which is not a surprise because there's a lot of disagreement in the scientific communities what actually extends our lifespan uh, <clears throat> but it's one agreement uh, decreasing our calorie intake would actually add at least two three or even five healthy years to your life so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a big fan of it I, I, I love this whole kind of access of energy that I get in the end of fasting so I, I actually do like two types of fasting three times one Every day, I, you know, I try to fast uh, at least uh, for like 18 hours, including my sleep time. And then my, so my food consumption window is within like six hours. And it's, you know, I'm, I'm not really a morning person. 
So that's why it's always like a lunch and a dinner uh, between 12 and 6. So that's kind of one type of fasting. It's called intermediate fasting. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you, your audience heard about this this thing. And it's like easiest thing to, to um, where you can start uh, developing your fasting habits. The second type of fasting, uh, which is weekly fast, I usually do Sunday evening to Tuesday morning. And it's 36-hour fast. And I love it as well. I started with 24 hours, but then I thought, okay, you know, I'm going to go to bed in the next hour too. Okay. So can I just extend my fast for like from 24 hour to like 36 hour? Uh, Because I'm sleeping anyway. I mean, I'm not taking any food uh, during my sleep time. So this is what I do on a weekly basis. And then once every six months, I'm going to detox center and i usually do like four to five uh, days fast all of my fasting is with uh, like a lemon water or mm-hmm. herbal tea etc i actually tried like a dry fasting a few times for like 30, 36 hours without any liquid uh taken i like it more but i still didn't feel that it's it's like the friendliest routine to my body so i actually i actually thought like fasting with water or herbal tea is uh, like a safest way to do it. For some of the people, it's uh, fasting um, cannot be natural or against their medical condition. So, like if you if you're trying to experiment with fasting, probably intermediate fasting is fine to experiment with. But for longer fast, I would actually consult with your doctor first, and then you can uh, you can start it. So I I love this the kind of whole fasting thing, and that's why. So my diet is mostly plant plant based. Because mm-hmm. this is the easiest. Well, I mean, it's it's easy to say, Sergey, you need to, you know, eat at least or take out at least twenty or twenty five percent of your calorie intake. But it's really difficult to do. So fasting is helpful because automatically you just take out a lot of uh, extra calories from your day or from your week. Um, my second uh, tool on that: I don't do any added sugar, food, or drinks. And and actually, you know. I'm uh, uh, I'm a CEO of the fund, so my team uh, they don't have a choice like getting access <laughs> to to good drinks. So if you look at our small kitchenette that we have in the in the office, it's it's like lemonade that we produce ourselves with no sugar, just lemons, grapefruits uh, there as well. Uh, different herbal teas, decaf coffee is always offered. I'm on decaf coffee for the last um, four years because oh, wow. I'm very. Res- I'm very like receptive to the caffeine mm. uh and like if, if i would drink a couple of espressos of like 2 p.m then i'll go to bed around 1 or 2 a.m and actually my deep sleep moves from kind of midnight uh, or from the beginning of the sleep time towards the morning which is not really helpful um but i love coffee so i you know i do like three or five um, espresso equivalents every day with uh usually with coconut milk uh and um and i really i I actually do think the current level of development of um uh coffee production uh is so advanced so you couldn't really tell the difference whether it's the uh decaf or normal coffee um as well so then again how do i decrease my calories one is is uh, mostly plant-based um sorry first is fasting second yeah i took out all the sugar uh from food and drinks and third i'm mostly plant-based i'm not really religious in terms of you know, becoming a vegetarian but a lot of my friends are vegans um but i'm trying to balance my diet so i decrease really radically my my intake of animal protein and fish protein as well and if if i do it then it's um, in most of the cases uh, it's organic, um, and some people think it expensive. I, I was actually looking at the study done in the U.S. a couple of years ago, when when uh, on a family basis, a family switch to more plant-based version of the diet, so like integrate more plants and vegetables in their diet, and they prepare it at home. They actually saves at least nine hundred and fifty dollars per household uh, on uh, on an annual basis. So that's mm. that's actually healthy for your finances um, as well. So that's kind of food stuff. Um, I'm trying not to eat after six p.m. Uh, thought I, you know I, I love doing that, 
but uh, it's not necessarily helpful for my sleep as well. So we'll come back to the sleep in, in the end of, um, of conversation. <clears throat> so what we covered, uh, morning uh, fasting and diet habits and physical exercises. We, we did discuss, you know, yeah, that I'm doing something uh, <clears throat> like six out of seven days um, every week. Uh, <clears throat> what is important for me is doing my 10,000 steps a day. And we have this binary view of um, of uh, how our physical activity should look like. So it's either like I'm, I'm just sitting at home uh, watching the screen where other people do uh, football you know, or uh, <clears throat> any other sport. So this is my way to exercise. Or the other extreme, you know, I need to run a marathon mm -hmm. or I need to uh, become an Iron Man or Iron Woman. So uh, I do think there is something in between and, and doing 10,000 steps a day measured by your favorite wearable, whatever you like, um, is a great baseline because it helps your body. Like it helps with a lot of things in terms of your metabolic balance, um, joints, um, bones, uh, muscles, uh, activity, etc. cetera. So um, that's what I'm doing. And I'm, again, I'm, like in my case, I'm using either Whoop or um, or Apple Watch to measure 10,000 steps uh, a day as well. And I'm integrated walking in a lot of um, activities that I do during the day. I, I, usually at least one or two Zoom calls I'm yeah. doing when I'm walking. And it's pretty cool. I have very strong right hand because of that, because I need to <laughs> carry my smartphone so people can see me on zoom but it's uh, i think it's it's kind of cool that we can integrate walking in so many parts of our life um what else uh obviously you know i i'm avoiding uh <clears throat> only bad habits so i'm not uh, smoking uh, i did uh probably four years of smoking when i was young and when i was a student but uh, i was 25 years ago i'm 50 now uh, if you in, by my chronological age, my biological age, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, is, uh, yeah. So my biological age is uh, somewhere around forty-three uh, at the moment, but it was twenty-five years ago, and uh, and so I don't do smoking because smoking is like literally ten minus ten minus ten years from your lifespan and health span. It's almost like a cancer lottery in a way. I always use in my seat belts, even if I'm on a rare seat, and even if when I'm in a country where you can actually avoid using your seat belts on a rare uh, seat of your car, uh, I don't. I avoided, you know, all this spike of interest into motorcycle riding. What I've seen in a circle of my friends. I don't know if you've seen this uh, graph uh, or this chart. I think it was done by Harley Davidson and uh, it's for the male and and how this sales volume for motorcycles look through the years for the age different age cohorts for men so it's like this this and this and then around 45 it peaks like that <laughs> yeah. and it goes down so motorcycle riding is uh, 17 times more mortal and more dangerous than driving the car so mm. Uh, so this this whole piece that we just discussed in the last two minutes for me is don't die stupid or yeah. don't do stupid or passive longevity if you want to have a polite way of uh, uh, saying that. Um, so we mostly covered uh, this one. And finally, in terms of our spiritual health, there's, there's important part of my you know, different longevity buckets that I cover in the book. By the way, the book called the Science and Technology of Growing Young. It was published August last year and immediately became Wall Street Journal bestseller, USA Today bestseller, number one on Amazon in three different categories. So it became very popular. The, the, the largest part of the book, the largest chapter in the book is a bonus chapter called Who Wants to Live Forever? But it's not about living forever. It's about 10 longevity choices that you can make. And yeah. so, um, and I do believe that um, the final part of it, which I call it peace of mind, uh, is extremely important. So I actually put sleep there because sleep is very important for our hormonal and um, our mental health as well. My rule is eight hours in the bed, which is seven hours of sleep. And uh, quoting one of my friends who uh, owns uh, and runs Longevity Clinic in London, 
uh, every evening, we can visit the most powerful clinic in the world. Uh, we go to bed. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a really nice way of, um, of putting uh, or highlighting importance of sleep for us. I'm, I'm, uh, I changed my relationship with sleep after reading um, Why We Sleep by Matthew yeah. Walker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, before that, I was just using my sleep hours like an endless credit to do some other stuff in life. Right now, I'm, I'm actually pretty disciplined in terms of spending eight hours uh, in a bed. And I'm, I'm using Oura Ring during the night. So I'm taking out my Whoop and I'm taking out my Apple Watch. Um, and I do think Oura has a very good algorithm, specifically Oura 3, uh, for different sleep stages. So I'm trying to maximize my deep sleep for this to be at least two hours every night. I started with 30 to 45 minutes, and um, I think it was Dave Esprit, a uh, very good friend, uh, father of biohacking in the world, and Matthew Walker with uh, his book who influenced me and gave me a lot of uh, small tips how to uh, structure my approach to sleep and maximize my deep sleep and my sleep hours uh, yeah, um, yeah. as well. Um, yeah, but also the rest is like meditation, uh, sense of purpose. It, it is very important to have healthy relationship with, uh, with the world, give more than you take, make other people winners, manage your ego and, uh, trying to do something for the world to become a better place. So this is, I found my mission back in 2014 after my personal health crisis. And, uh, it's been probably the most enjoyable part of my life. Uh, yeah. And there's the other and the final comment on that. Um, I actually start my day with mantra while I'm still in the bed. And this mantra is in the context of psychological aspects of aging. Uh, there's a part of my book. It's actually called Think and Grow Young. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which, right. uh, which is, says like, if you think about yourself, like as a younger person, your body will respond to that on so many levels and systems. So a few years ago, I started to 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 begin my day with the mantra, uh, which I'm repeating a few times in the morning, and it says, "I'm going to be living 200 years in the body of 25 years old man." And my body responds to that beautifully. Um, so, uh, in fact, I actually have four ages. If you want to hear about this, yeah, one is chronological. I'm, I'm I'm 50 years old. I'm 50 uh -huh. years young, okay, yeah. Sergey. So 50 years young. Then my biological age, measured by set of biomarkers and photo and video age, which is basically AI measuring, uh, predicting your biological age uh, mm -hmm. by using your photo and video, is uh, 43 years. Then I feel myself like I'm 35 years young, and then but my target age psychological age as you just heard is 25 so yeah i have like four different ages and this is the beautiful psychological experiment that all of us can do just yeah. in the next month or so start every morning with with your thoughts that you are much much younger than uh, than the figure that you see in your own passport and look how your body and, and mind will respond to that you'll see the difference it's just amazing and I, yeah. okay, I, so I can go on and on about you know, different, <laughs> we still haven't covered supplements. This supplements, is my, yeah. yeah, this is my afternoon set of supplements. I'm a big fan of supplements because I'm a typical placebo guy, like 30 <laughs> to 40%, 30 or 40% of the supplements, um, uh, like an impact on our health is actually driven by placebo effect. So if, mm -hmm. if I do believe that it actually works well for my body, then it works well. Yeah. Uh, so um, I love it. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. You know, you know, <laughs> as I was uh, listening to your day and all the things that you talk about, you sound like someone who listens to the Doctor's Kitchen podcast and has put everything in action there, which is great yeah. to hear. Because you know, we talked yeah. about fasting with Walter Lungo. We've had a number of different researchers looking at yeah. sleep as well. Yeah. And so it was, it's lovely to hear that it's actually been put into practice. But I guess, you know, when you're in this when you're in this field, it's very hard to not want to put these things into action immediately. And I guess what I'd love to get your opinion on, given that you know you, you live and breathe this and you're actually walking the walk as well, is what is the investor field looking like in terms of the future? And what things are on the five to 10 year horizon versus yeah. ones that are a lot later. And I, and I think we can probably split these up into different areas as well, because yeah. as, as I imagine from your book as well, 
there's so much stuff going on and it's, and it's oh, quite yeah. complicated mm-hmm. and what, what were the supplements that you just took as well i just want to <laughs> yeah so supplements i actually on my website which is sergeyyoung.com and it's all for free um, yeah. um there's a infographic called 10 longevity supplements i don't know if you can see that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i can see that yeah, yeah. And like you can, or your audience can download this we have a beautiful newsletter actually distilling science into very simple work mm. um and uh so supplements uh, let me come back and in, in, literally in one or two minutes we'll come back to your questions about different horizons where innovation technological breakthroughs and scientific discoveries will be available to us but like on supplements and again remember there is a placebo effect and if you're a placebo man or woman you're going to respond to that um so vitamin d is uh, i do believe that um our lifestyle uh, has changed significantly in the last uh, thousand years we always under the roof we are in the car or in the office or at home so we don't have time to develop like appropriate level of vitamin d so i'm supplementing myself with vitamin d by the way for your supplement mix you can experiment yourself but i would advise actually to ask the help of the doctor or nutritionist um then it's going to be much more comprehensive um so vitamin d and then omega-3 uh <clears throat> i have particularly high cholesterol level i am genetically predisposed Mm. Uh, to have high cholesterol so i'm actually um, i'm taking quite a lot of omega-3 i usually use the nordic uh, one which they do from small oily wild fish Um, then what else milk thistle for my liver and and it's all on rotation with the exception of vitamin d and omega-3 the rest is like you know, I'm taking this for a month and then I'm waiting three to five months to do another one month course, right? So I'm, I'm a huge fan of not constantly supplementing my own body, but I leave a lot of capacity for body to develop this thing and get it from uh, the food to the extent that we can, uh, given the current development of the food industry and food supply chain. But um, so it's milk thistle, seaweed. I'm a big fan of seaweeds. So I was born not in the middle of nowhere, in the end of nowhere, in the USSR, in a place uh, which which was closer to Japan. I live literally like 200 oh, wow. miles across from the northern Japanese island. And it was 300 miles to the regional capital and 200 miles to Japan. But it was former USSR. There's no way I can travel to Japan like I, you know, I do uh today almost every year or almost like a twice a year so i'm a big fan of seaweeds and i have six different types of seaweed on rotation so like every month i'll take like spirulina um kelp um fukudan uh some of the japanese uh, seaweeds uh as well uh to do that um what else in terms of longevity supplements there's a number of like nad plus uh boosters the one that i take is nmn and I'm doing this for the last uh, uh, two years. And uh, this was after like talking to David Sinclair from Harvard Medical School, um, for, to Peter Diamantes from X Prize Foundation, even Eric Verdin, uh, the head of uh, Buck Institute of Aging Research, mm-hmm. uh, they based in California. Uh, so they all like were so positive about Animan. So I thought, yeah, I'll just need to give it a try. Um, yeah, I'm taking quite a lot of fiber in the form of um, plants, but mm-hmm. also um, like I added fiber. I use the Indian one. Uh, I don't know if I have it here. Yeah, it's like this. Uh, I yeah, this one. I, it's oh, yeah, beautiful. It's like the yeah, softest, yeah. yeah, the softest fiber I've ever had in my life. It's yeah. like it feels so great. I love it. Um, uh, what else? Uh, I actually like. I changed my relationship with fiber after experimenting with continuous glucose monitor. Oh, yeah. I don't have it now, mm. but um, for the last six months, I use uh, CGM uh, at least four times, and it actually works for 14 days. And it's you can easily synchronize it with your yeah. Um, yeah. smartphone. And uh, it was fascinating to see the relationship between the food and, and drinks that I take with my glucose spikes. And yeah. some of the outcomes are pretty obvious, like um, 
like if you take freshly squeezed orange juice, you think it's healthy, but it's like you just taken the sugar, right? You know, up to this level. Uh, it's going to be on any possible boundaries. Uh, so I, I was expecting that. Well, the other thing uh, that I was not expecting, like if you take like a portion of vegetables right in the beginning of your meal, and uh, I, the first time I, I read this was, I think it was Tim Ferriss, I think four hours work week. No, it was four hours body, I think, uh, his book. And um, you can actually take um, um, some of the prohibited or blacklisted food later on. So I'm like, I'm a big fan of pasta, big yeah. fan of uh, gelato, or which is ice cream yeah. in Italian. So, and I don't do it uh, frequently, but if I do it like once a month, I would actually take vegetables first. And it's actually what it does uh, if you start with vegetables is actually uh, slow down uh, and, and, um, Mm, and decrease the rate of growth of your like it's almost like a smoothen your glucose spike inside uh sorry in um uh, in your blood so it was really fascinating just to observe like relationship between you know all these intakes that i have and my uh glucose level and um I think and also I, cgms are going to be really useful i think when it comes to what food combinations work for different people oh yeah because you're yeah. right that that phenomena of seeing something that is you know quote unquote unhealthy being actually uh pretty good as far as we look at w with regard to the um the sugar level in your blood that mm -hmm. that's super interesting i think that's like a, a very easy understandable tangible idea for for listeners to think about how data is going to really drive personalized nutrition yeah. It's just an example, right? Yeah. But yeah. what I also like, I'm a very visual person and I really respond to like visual stimulus, if you want, if I can use this word. And um, when you're actually about to take something which you know is not super healthy, you just visualize, okay, I'm going to, you know, in 15 minutes or like in 30 minutes, I'm going to look at my, uh, in, in my app, which shows my, you know, glucose in the blood and I'll see the spike. It actually prevents you uh from making unhealthy food choices that's what i like uh but remember i'm like forgive me i'm placebo man so i'm really responding to <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah and also else? don't forget uh, the uh nocebo effect as well because like i i agree that like i wear a ring i track my sleep and all that kind of stuff and if i uh do something and i expect that's going to have a detrimental impact that's very good for my behavior change but at the same time, I don't want to engage that nocebo effect where the spike in my sugar is high or I feel worse, even because that's also driven psychologically as well. But yeah, just just a, a tidbit for, for other people. <laughs> okay, what else? Magnesium, uh, garlic concentrate. Right now, you have a lot of garlic supplements and they are odorless. Uh, or you can take garlic if you want to maintain the social distancing. I uh, <laughs> think, um, yeah, that's that's you know pretty much it that i have on my top 10 uh supplements choices okay that was pretty lengthy no, answer no, no, that's to good. that's good it's, 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 it's lovely to hear the insights <laughs> sergey this has been uh brilliant <laughs> in terms of like, all the information Thanks, you have the, the book's brilliant it's got so much information about what the future could look like and uh i think it's you know it might be premature to think about the uh moral implications and you know as humans we have a checkered past with uh power struggles and invasions on the rest of it so i think it's nice to think about this because like you said th this is inevitable the technology around around longevity is coming um, and we have to prepare for it as much as possible so it's great and the book's fab thank you thanks ruby and to no our audience stay healthy and happy we all going to be living longer or significantly longer than we expect there are a number of implications uh, from this thought and this key message of the book on so many dimensions like personal health strategy, personal financial strategy, relationship, career, education, kids, etc. Just give it a thought. It's, uh, it's an amazing journey to realize how many opportunities we have to live longer, healthier and happier life. Yeah, that's fab. Thank you so much.